once again, welcome at Cold Camp. This time online, we're of course we're looking forward to uh, to have it back soon, as soon as possible, uh, in person. Uh, but for now, I think we're we're good. Okay. We, we can fly a plane. We can have the conference at the same time. So lots of advantages. Yep, it's good. It's good. I like this remote working thing. It it has its advantages. I miss some of the old things, but I, I like many of the of the remote things. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it brought some good things. Uh, but what do you have in store for us today? So today I have a uh, presentation I've uh, made specifically for this event, uh, and I've called it "Grokking Agility." So the things that I do. So my background is in software development a long, long time ago. I'm, uh, I'm a bit older than I look. I know I look young, but you know, <laughs> I'm not that young. So I did a bunch of software development for a while. And then I did um, a bunch of IT management, management roles in various um, software development capabilities. And for the past uh, six years now, I've had my own little company where I primarily do leadership consultancy and training and agile consultancy and training. And not surprisingly, I like to mix these things because I like the idea of agility quite a lot. Um, and I like the idea of leadership quite a lot. And, and uh, from everything I've seen working with um, IT companies, large and small, this whole agility thing, the idea of being agile, matter, it matters so much what kind of people you have, what kind of teams you have, and how you do your leadership, so to say. It's not enough just to understand the uh, Scrum or whatever and try to apply it. It's not going to work. And the presentation today is going to be a bit about this, about this agility we all want to achieve uh, because it's great. Uh, but what, what is it? What does it mean? How do we achieve it? And what are the fundamental things we need to have in place more than just learning a methodology, whatever that methodology is? So basically, don't, do, don't follow practices for the sake of practices, but understand uh, the other things. Uh, well, yep, something like that, yeah. Uh, let's do it like this. Start uh, you start with the, start the presentation and then we fade out. Okay. We get together at the end for a discussion and maybe uh, we'll have also some questions for the audience. I bet we'll have questions. Okay, good luck. All right. Thank you, Andre. I've shared my screen. Can you see my screen? Just one final question before you guys go. Positive. Perfect. So I'll just start talking. I don't know how the questions come. I assume they'll come in writing and uh, someone we'll, is going we'll to... We'll take care of that at the end of your session. No worries. So I encourage everyone listening uh, and watching. If you have any questions, please type them. I'm more than happy to take questions. And even if for whatever reasons we don't have time to answer them all at the end, I'll be happy to follow up and get in touch and talk about it. These are topics I'm passionate about and I like talking about them. So grok is a word that's made up by a novelist just not so long ago, well, 60, 70 years ago, but that's uh, fresh for a word. And it means to profoundly understand something. So when, when I'm saying I'm grokking something, it means that I am really, really, really understanding it intimately and deeply. It's not just a superficial kind of understanding, it's a deep kind of understanding. So that is what I want to talk about today, about trying to deeply understand Agile in, in the very fundamental pieces of it. I'll try to keep it very specific at the same time and sort of give real world examples, but I am definitely going to focus on some very core concepts. And the uh, uh, fascinating thing to me uh, about Agile is that, and everything really in life, but Agile particularly, is that it's such a simple thing to understand intellectually. So if you want to put it on paper and just say, okay, well, what is Agile? It's not quantum mechanics. It's not rocket science. It's, it's really simple to understand intellectually what it is. And even so, very few people do it well. And um, from my direct observations, consulting and helping and working with teams of all kinds and sizes, the most of the times the reasons why very few people do it well have something to do with the culture of that company and the way they're organized and the way they do leadership. So I want to explore some of those aspects today. So just to set the scene for this presentation, I will not talk about any particular methodology. So I will not get into the details of Scrum or Kanban or SAFE or whatever. 
Um, I will, I, I'm not trying to be for or against anything. So I'm not trying to say that option A is better than option B or that Scrum is better than this or that sucks or I'm trying to have a sort of mature business oriented perspective. I'm interested in getting things done. So um, I'm trying to have a pragmatic point of view. How do you get things done? And I'll, I'll focus more on agility in the sense of business agility, like real agility and try to understand what that is rather than agile in the sense of process, like you know, learning how to do the sprint planning or learning how to use Jira or learning how to do the daily stand-up. I'll be talking about the more fundamental kind of agility, which is the end goal in between. And I'll touch a couple of main points around which I'll have my conversation. Um, things I hear a lot uh, with the people I work with are things like this one. Agile will fix it. Right? People say that. So they have problems. They're not delivering, they're late, their quality is bad, the clients is, are, aren't happy, whatever. And someone that has the idea like, we'll do Agile and it will be great. And the only reaction to that is, is this one. Um, and an even funnier idea is when you're not saying that we'll do Agile, but a specific kind of Agile. And if we just do that specific kind of Agile, it will fix all our problems. And the only reaction to that is even more, um, more fun. Uh, because when you have problems in your team, in your company, in your organization, those problems are probably deeply rooted and they're not going to be fixed by you. Uh, suddenly organizing yourself in something you call sprints or whatever. You have to start before that uh, if you want to make it work. The kinds of problem I frequently see in organizations that do agile but don't manage to do it well is managers under managing. Uh, we all know about the over managing uh, uh, part of the equation, the detail management, the micromanagement. Nobody wants that. Nobody uh, likes that, well, very few people like that. But we also have the other problem, which is undermanaging, which is a very common problem from what I see, because um, suddenly organizations say, we're gonna do agile and managers uh, take too many steps back. And they say like, okay, so this is all self-organizing. Nobody knows what self-organizing means, but okay, this is self-organizing. We're not gonna say anything anymore. We're not gonna manage anything anymore because management is bad. And uh, this is not the right attitude. Under managing is as big of a problem as over managing. Teams don't deliver, then uh, nobody really knows exactly why, because people seem to be working and you know, they, uh, they're putting in the effort. Uh, bad apples are left untouched. This is a common uh, symptom of pro problems that are unaddressed. Um, people don't address the bad apples, the uh, negative individuals in the organization, and leaders don't lead. And um, this is probably the biggest problem and the root cause of all the problems. So let's explore a bit of that. Uh, a common misconception I see in people, and they don't say it like this, but this is sort of what's in the back of their mind uh, when they speak about Agile, is that Agile sort of replaces hard work and discipline. And, uh, you just need to do Agile and you enter this magical heaven, the, the promised kingdom, where everything just works, man, because people are good and they have good hearts and, uh, you, you know, the sun shines and the unicorns run around and it's just butterflies everywhere and, 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 and everything just works. Like, you just have to get out of the way of it and it just works. And that's definitely not the case. I mean, nothing works and particularly agile doesn't work without discipline and hard work. And by discipline, I primarily mean self-discipline. I don't mean the discipline of somebody imposing discipline, but I mean the self-discipline that each person in those teams and each team and each group of people need to have. And it's a lot of hard work and you need discipline more in agile than you need in non-agile environments because in non-agile environments, you have someone sort of bugging you, like do this, do this, do that, do that. So that's not good. I'm not saying that's good, but at least that sort of reminds you about what you need to do. <laughs> in Agile, you're supposed to have initiative and, and decide on your own that you need to do things and start doing things. And you cannot do that without discipline. So I think too many, too many people focus on the unicorns and too few people focus on the discipline. 
Agile requires discipline, self-discipline primarily, and all kinds of discipline. It's a fluid kind of discipline. It's not a micromanaged kind of discipline, but it's discipline. It's key. It's absolutely key. And the other fundamental thing I want to say is that Agile doesn't change your culture. From the contrary, if you have a bad culture and you try to do Agile, your bad culture is going to mess up the Agile and you're not going to do good Agile. So if you have a bad culture in your company, you doing Agile is not going to fix anything. You're just going to, you're just going to do bad Agile. So you got to start with the culture. So let's, deep, let's dive into these things and, and, and look at a few specific things. And I'm just going to work around a few examples. So let's assume one example, one challenge you have is to build a team. You, you have to put together a software development team to deliver a project. And this act of putting together a team is like a little project in itself. You have to find people, interview people, select people, whatever, do all that stuff. And it's just an example. Everything I'm going to say about this equally applies to building a software product, for example, or building anything. Um, but I'm using this as an example because maybe it's an easier to understand example for everyone. So let's say we have this challenge. We want to build a team. And we are an agile company, right? We're an agile business. How do we build a team in an agile way? Um, so let's take a look first at who's involved typically in building a team. And it varies from company to company, but in most companies that are medium-sized and above, you'll find typically a client directly or indirectly asking for a team. Uh, you'll find some recruiting people, you'll find some HR admin people, you'll find some line management person type of thing that you know has a budget and those people are gonna come in his or her department and budget. You find some technical leaders that will interview those people and decide that they meet whatever standards they're looking for. You're going to find the people that are already in that project that are looking for new people, deciding if those people are right for this project, for this client. So you find these kind of actors working together to build a team. And if we ask ourselves the question, how do we do this in an agile way? That is, how do we decide if we do it in an agile way or not? I mean, what is what does it mean to be agile? Because it doesn't just mean to sort of, uh, change your mind a lot or, or answer the phone quickly or just be flexible as an individual. Because sometimes people think that just because you're sort of flexible and you respond quickly and you say yes to a lot of things, that means you're agile. And it doesn't, it's, it's a different thing. It's two different things. So to structure the conversation a little bit, I'm going back, back to lean. So let's talk a little bit about value chain. I don't know how many of you have heard about the value chain is one of the most important things you can hear about if you're interested in leadership or management of any sort. You need to understand the whole value chain, value streams concept. So let's look at the whole thing through this perspective. I'll define the value chain a little bit first and I'll define it with another example. So another example, a different example. Let's say you want to start a business and the business that you want to start, you want to sell Bavarian pretzels. That is the business you want to start. You, are un, you want to become an entrepreneur, you have some money, you want to start selling Bavarian pretzels. So now we identify the value chain for this business. And what is, you identify the value chain by asking yourself this question, what is the end result of my business? I'm not gonna think about what I have inside my business what people I have inside my business, what technology I have inside my business, what equipment I have inside my business, what process I have inside my business. That's not important right now. All I'm thinking is what is the end result of my business? And the end result of my business is simple in this example. I want to sell Bavarian pretzels for good money to happy customers. That is what I want to do. And now to I understand and define your value chain, you start working backwards. So you know your destination. Your destination is this, selling pretzels for good money to happy customers. That's where you want to get. And then you plan from the end. You start with the end and then take a step back. Okay, in order to have this, what do I need to have? And then in order to have this, what do I need to have? And you always want to have the minimum. So you always ask yourself, what is the minimum, the fastest, cheapest thing I can do to get to that result? So it will look something like this. Obviously this is simplified, but something like this. So first you need a place to sell the pretzels, right? 
you ask yourself a question, do I want my own place or can I have a partnership, I don't know, with a cafeteria and they will sell my pretzels in their, uh, I don't know, in, in, in their location or maybe both. And then you ask, what is the, let's say you decide you want your place. Then you ask, what is the minimum thing we need for our place? So what is the minimum thing we need? You need to find the, the minimum equipment location and all those requirements. And then you also need the, a place to make them or buy them. So the first, you have a decision if you want to make them yourself or maybe buy them from someone else and you just sell them. And let's say you want to make them. So you ask yourself, what is the minimum thing we need to make them? And so on and so on. Of course, in the real life example, it'll be a bit more complicated, but not that much more complicated. And you might wonder yourself, why the minimum? Why the question is, what is the minimum, the smallest, simplest, easiest, cheapest, fastest thing we can do to solve the problem? This, this kind of question, you always want in any kind of, agility, agile, you always want to ask yourself this kind of a question. What is the minimum thing we can do to solve the problem? The simplest, the fastest thing. And some people might say, oh, but that means that you will deliver bad, bad services or you will not have quality. And they're not necessarily right. The idea is to be fast because, for example, in this, exa in this example with the pretzels, you want to be selling pretzels quickly. And as soon as you start selling pretzels and you meet the market, you will find out so much, so many more things. Uh, you will know if people like it, they don't like it, if they want to pay less for it, maybe they're willing to pay more for it, maybe they want it bigger, smaller, whatever. If you want to get to that point where you deliver something as fast as possible so you can learn and improve your service. And that's why you want to do the minimum. And the absolute wrong thing to start a business like this, the wrong way would be from, from the other side. So you're not thinking about the end result. You're not thinking about the value chain. You're thinking about what you have. You have some things around you. You have some ideas. Maybe you, you know a particular oven, that the pretzels oven that's on sale right now. So ah, let's get that oven because it looks cool and it's cheap. Or maybe you have a particular place where you want to sell the, the pretzels. And then because you, you, you fall in love with these ideas and you start building around them, but you're building around something that is not the end result of your business. And this is how you get to become bureaucratic and not agile in time. I mean, with just the pretzel shop, it, it's still small enough to sort of do all kinds of things, but this is how things go bad. So going back to, so the, here's an interesting exercise for you to do. And you can do this in your business. If you're like a business owner, you can do it in your team. If you're a team leader, or even if you're not a team leader, you can do it at any level. It doesn't have to be done only on the whole business. You can do it on a team or a department or a project or whatever. So define your value chain in theoretically, like I told you so. So ask yourself the question, what is the end result of this team? So this team will build this application or whatever. And then work back from that. And I, I understand what is the minimum, fastest, simplest things you need to do in order to do that. And you'll end up with a tree of things, like a, a few things you need to do. Put that to the side, now look at the reality. And you'll find typically many more things that you do than the minimum that you need to do. You'll find a lot more stuff that you do. Uh, there's many more steps in the process, more frameworks, more documents, more checks, more meetings, more ever. There's more stuff in reality than in the value chain. And then you look at the difference and you really, really ask yourself, do we really need this extra stuff? Or can we just drop it? Because in business, in, in organizing things, it's just like in writing code. Uh, there was that famous saying, that guy whose names I forget, but he was one of the authors of Unix back in the 60s. He said, one of the most productive days is when I remove a thousand lines of code. So simplifying things is great. And when you talk about organizing things, and Agile is all about organizing things, right? Organizing teams, people, and so on. It's usually more valuable to simplify things and remove stuff than to add stuff. And by remove stuff, I mean process, remove steps, remove checks, remove documents, remove everything. So this is one way to remove things. You look, define your value chain and what you have extra, it might actually be extra and go ahead and remove it. So if we go back to the building a team example, and we know, we, we know about the value chain and we think about the value chain and the question is, okay, we need to build a team that's good enough for this client. That's the end goal. And you work back from that and say, what is the minimum, fastest, simplest thing we can do to build a team? 
And we'll come up with an answer. And that answer will be the value chain. And then we'll look at reality. And this kind of reality we have on the slide here, is this the minimum we can do? Definitely not. This is, this is far, far from the minimum. And this is completely unproductive as a way of working. Everybody, everybody, every one of these people wants to do something. They all want to do something. Uh, the recruiting wants to have a bunch of interviews, but the tech leadership also wants to have a bunch of interviews. And project management always have, also wants to have some interviews. And uh, there's another guy that has an opinion. And then we need someone from finance or whatever to send us a contract. And uh, they have an opinion about that. So everybody wants to do something. It's not the simplest thing, and it's not the direct thing, and it's not the fastest thing. It's just the result of the current structure, and it's probably a bureaucratic, overcomplicated structure. So basically, in effect, what you need to do to get anything done is for the planets need to align. So it's like everybody has to somehow magically have the same opinion about that thing, and that's why it's difficult to get anything done in companies, in big companies especially. Anything, no matter what. It's really difficult to get to, to get done because everybody has an opinion about it and nothing is simple. And that's not agile. And the reason why this happens is two main reasons. One is people think in silos. So silo is like their department, their team. They think about that and that's their world and the bigger thing around them, you know, it says on the website that we are all one team, but in practice, that is rarely the case. So people think very um, tribally. And then everybody wants to add stuff with good intentions. You hire someone new, the recruiting team, and they feel that the way to bring some value is to let's structure the interview process a little bit more. And I have another test we can give the candidates. And it's a good test because I've learned about it and I've read about it. And it's good intentions, but the end result is they're adding more crap. And the guy from tech as well, I want to give them another test or we want them to know this too or whatever. And they had good intentions, but they add more crap and you add more crap and you add more crap. And you end up having a huge bloated process and organization with many things that need to happen in order for anything to get done. The planning needs to be aligned or nothing will happen. A better way, of course, would be for everyone to work together collaboratively, thinking about the bigger picture and forgetting about, you know, how they do things individually or in their department and just focusing on the end result. That is difficult to happen. It rarely happens because two main reasons, how people are paid and how they get their professional pride. Uh, so people are usually paid based on how well they do in their department. And they also feel good about themselves if they are good at whatever their profession is. So the tech guy will feel good if he is a good tech guy and the recruiter will feel good if he is a good recruiter. So everyone just think about their own profession and they add more stuff in that area. So this complicates everything. So value chains, understanding value chains. If you should really understand value chains, you're gonna see them everywhere and you're gonna to wanna to cut so much stuff <laughs> that It'll be, it'll, be, it'll, it'll be amazing. You'll just look around the, in your company and you'll see waste everywhere. Like, why do we do this? Why do we do that? Why do we do this? You want to simplify things and that'll be a good thing to do. The other principle is just in time. Of course, you all heard about just in time, right? So a temptation we all have when we work on something, going back to the pretzel example, is like something like the text here. So for example, if I sell them on the street in one of these uh, whatever stands, and I bake them somewhere in the building behind 500 meters away. So I have to go and bring uh, pretzels from the bakery, put them in the stand, sell them, bring some more and so on. And the initial temptation is to say things like, I'll bring more at the same time. So I don't have to go back and forth so much. And it sounds reasonable, but it's not. <laughs> uh, and also you want, may want to bake more at the same time. And that sounds reasonable too, but it's bad because this is completely non-agile. This is building inventories and batching. So the just-in-time question is, what is, how can I get as close as possible to a kind of build for order? So in an ideal world, you bake one pretzel when the client, when the customer orders it. If that's not possible, then you, you bake five at a time or 10 at a time, but not 500. <laughs> Because, you know, if, what if it rains and you have to close down and nobody buys pretzels, then you have all these extra pretzels and they go cold and all that kind of stuff. And it's the same thing in software. People will say things like, 
uh, man, we have to do something, uh, uh, but I don't want to do it every time. So let's just build this framework that will solve the problem forever. And this is the same thing. It's just like being, bringing 500 pretzels just, just so we have them. <laughs> and just like with the pretzels, something might happen and your framework might not serve any useful purpose. So it's wasted effort. And also it's going to be negative because now it's something that every future person has to learn and take into account. So it's, it's a burden as well. And the same thing with process, the manager is going to look and say, okay, we have this issue. We have this problem, right? Uh, there's chaos. Let me fix it by introducing a rule, a guideline. And you really need to think, do I really need to introduce a guideline? Because that guideline is, is like putting a rock in my backpack. I'm going to carry it forever. Every rule, every process, everything we do is something we have to carry with us forever. Because if I make it, then everybody has to learn it. I have to educate, they have to follow it. I have to remind them. And it's all this work we do. Sometimes it's just better not to do anything about it. If it's not such a huge thing, just let it go and focus on what matters. So just in time, Here's how people, going back to the building a team example, here's how people get it wrong when they build a team. So the recruiter might say something like, you know, I don't want to process two candidates or three candidates and go to uh, the next step in the process. It's too little. Let me process a hundred CVs at a time. I want to do a lot of good chunk work, right? A good, good chunk of work. And I'll process a hundred CVs and only then I'll go with a report for the entire hundred CVs. Um, and uh, the, the tech leadership is going to say, I don't want to interview just one guy. I don't want to change my schedule for just one guy. I'm a busy person. Bring me five candidates at the same time. And I'll just book a half a day for all of them. And everybody thinks like that. And this is building inventories and batching. And this is completely non-agile. It's the most non-agile way of doing things. Um, and again, in order to get anything done, the planets have to align. You know, this guy has to have time, have time, and that guy has to have time, and this guy has to have... It's very difficult to get anything done. People think in silos, it's again the reason why this happens. A better way is small batch, uh, the work cell concept, which is work cell concept is a lean concept, and it means people that work on the same thing, they are together working at the same time on that thing. It's the same idea as the cross-functional team from Scrum. So the cross-functional team from Scrum is just the work cell concept from Lean. So these bunch of people work together on this. We put them together so they always can work on something and they don't have to go chase each other. They're already there working on that. So the same idea should be applied to an example like recruiting someone. So put everyone together, the candidate, the recruiter, whoever has something to say about it together, just do one big, you know, Scrum, uh, quote unquote, and get it done and be fast about it. So agile process versus true agility. The process is easy, doesn't solve anything if you don't have true agility. Um, from the country, if you want to do agile in terms of process and you don't have true agility, it's worse than not even doing it because you lose whatever you had and you're pretending you're doing something you're not capable of doing. So true agility is, is the most important thing. So here's just a few things to keep in mind. So in your company, in your team, you may be doing Scrum, Kanban, or whatever, perfectly. Like you went to the training, you got the certification. Uh, you know exactly what a story point means. You know exactly why we use Fibonacci's numbers or why we don't use them or whatever. You are an expert in that. But if you can't work with sales, and every time sales want something from you, you're like, ah, those guys, you're not agile. It doesn't matter that you know Scrum or Kanban or whatever perfectly. You're not agile. The business is not agile because the two departments cannot work together. And that is the end. <laughs> Nothing else matters. I mean, who cares that you know Scrum if those things don't work? You can do the best agile planning in the world. You have all the cones of uncertainties and all the burn downs and all the burn ups and all that. But if you're batching and storing inventories and tech, like you're not doing just in time, you're not agile. You can have the best consensus and autonomous decision-making. Everybody wants love self-organization, right? But if you're not breaking down silos, and if you're not making value-driven just-in-time decisions, you're not agile. And you can be flexible, like I told in the beginning. You can be flexible, and flexibility has nothing to do with agility in the business sense of the word. Well, they have a little bit to do, but like I was telling you, people 
many times think that just because they're flexible and they're willing to adjust their plans, maybe they don't even have plans, they think they're agile. That's not agile. It's just, you know, flowing with the wind. But if you're not channeling, ch channeling change towards a value chain driven product or service, so it's okay to be flexible, but you're flexible in what direction? You should be flexible towards your value chain, towards the business value, towards the result, and not in any direction. You're not agile. Uh, why aren't these things happening? Well, simple why aren't these happening? So I told you, teams don't deliver. Let's ignore that for a while because that's the outcome usually of all these problems. Manager under manage, but the biggest problem is leaders don't lead. That's the biggest problem. Why don't leaders lead? Simple. When you try to break down silos, you will be faced by vicious, ferocious resistance from everyone, almost everyone. And it will be well-intended resistance. Imagine you, you are hired now to be the, I don't know, uh, software VP, uh, the medium-sized com software company somewhere in Yash or whatever. And you go there and you see these kind of problems. Recruiting doesn't work well with tech. Tech doesn't work well with sales. Those guys don't work well with those guys and so on. And you say, okay, oh, this is wrong. I, I saw this presentation at CodeCamp. I know how to fix it. Guys, you need to work together. You will face a lot of resistance, well-intended resistance, because the recruiter person is going to come and tell you, no, recruiting is an important thing and it needs to be done well. And we need to do all these steps. And here is why we do them. And then the tech guy is going to come and say, no. We need to do all these things. And this is why we're doing because people are very attached to how they do things. They get their pride their and identity from how they do things. And it's very difficult to change things. You can, but it's very difficult. And that's why, you know, uh, entrepreneurial companies uh, get things done, right? Because they have a, a bunch of people that founded that company that have a vision and they're like, I'm going to get this done. And if you don't like it, that's your problem. I'm going to get it done. Once that first generation of people sort of retire and that company becomes a corporation, then, you know, 20, 30 years later, you have just corporate managers and you would be amazed how powerless managers are, most managers, the vast majority of managers in big corporations. Every, I remember people that are not managers, they look up to their managers in corporations and they think those guys have so much power. They make so many decisions. They are powerless usually, they are completely powerless. They just manage excels left and right. If they wanna make some real change, the machine is gonna eat them. The machine hates change. It's very difficult to make, to make real change in big companies. And that's why it doesn't happen. It's as simple as that. So what, what is agility? Agility is a leadership thing, obviously. It's the business structure thing. It matters how you structure your departments or whatever, so you don't encourage this kind of this kind of tribal mentality. You want people to, if you want people to think like they're one big team and act together, this not, that will not just happen by itself magically. You have to encourage it through the right structure, through the right incentives, through the right kind of performance management, through the right kind of example, through the right kind of decision-making, all of these things. And only once you figure this thing out, go do scrum or come on or whatever, because then it might actually work. Um, self-diagnosing your company. So you may ask yourself, does my company or my team, again, any level, you can apply this at any level, have this problem. And all you have to do to figure out is listen. Just go and listen. Go to your meetings, uh, whatever meetings you have, and just listen to what people talk about. And if people talk a, a lot about the product they want to build or the service they want to deliver, hmm, that's good. But if people talk a lot about themselves or their colleagues, that's bad. And I sometimes see 90% of the conversation is about us. Like, I would do this, but those guys from the other department want that. And in order to convince that person to do that, and then they will want this. So let's prepare this document so that manager doesn't say anything. So basically, our attention and energy is focused on solving our internal bureaucracy problems, not on focusing, not on solving the value proposition we want to present to our clients. So just listen. And if people talk about themselves or their colleagues too much in this kind of a way, it's a bad sign. If people derive satisfaction from finding ways to work with other departments or teams, that's great. If people are happy because they sort of won an argument with another team, that's bad. I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard some tech people being happy that ah, I've proven to those sales guys that what they wanted was unachievable. 
I have proven to them it could not be done. I am so great. <laughs> and okay, maybe you write technically and that's fine. You shouldn't accept anything. I'm not saying that, but the fact that you derive satisfaction because you sort of proven to your colleagues that they're, uh, it's so bad, man, just work together. I mean, I, oh, it hurts. And people, then you, 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 another thing you need to listen about is when people talk about risk, what kind of risk are they referring to? So let's say you want to make a change in, in the team or in the company. And people will say, some people more than others will say, we cannot do it because there is a risk of uh, messing this up or that up or the other thing up. And that's not bad in itself, but what are those risks? If those risks are about actual, our ability to deliver value, that, that's good. But if those risks are about upsetting the existing bureaucracy, so no, we cannot do this because those guys are gonna be upset or that guy won't like it, or our people are not used to change, or then you know you're not agile because you wanna make a change and you cannot make the change because nobody wants change. Obviously you're not agile. So all you, all you need to do to know if you're agile or not is just see where the people's energy is going. And if the conversation and their energy is going towards managing the internal bureaucracy and process and bullshit, you're not agile. That's not an agile company. If their energy is going towards and they understand and they think about what are we trying to do here, then you're probably agile and yeah, try to do an agile process as well. It might suit you very well. And that's it actually, I'm done. So the and place is landed. Well, so you landed, right? Sorry? So you landed, right? I landed successfully, yeah. <laughs> I hope, well, we'll see yeah. the feedback, but I'm on the ground, yeah. Very much enjoyed it. Uh, and we have uh, some questions, of, of course. Please. And, I mean, there is no agile gathering without questions. It would be normal, right? Exactly. And the first question is, what's your advice for a rather large company which plans for an agile transformation? Uh, should it look at, I don't know, frameworks such as safe, less, and all the others? Or would you have or would they be beneficial? The answer could be yes or no, but in, in, in what context do they need to be prepared when, are look, when they are looking at such uh, scaling frameworks? Yeah, so of course they need to choose, uh, well, not, they, they need to understand the framework side of things and make some decisions there. Um, but before that, they should look at their people and their culture. So should, they should ask themselves things like, do we have leaders? Do our leaders make decisions? Are they courageous in a business sense of the word? Are they comfortable with uh, uncertainty? Uh, are they collaborative? Are they uh, interested in making things better? And they should look at their structure, departments, and uh, disciplines. Because I, and I, I'm speaking from real examples. I'm not, I'm not going to be specific, obviously, for obvious reasons. But if you have, for example, uh, developers are with the developers and the testers are with the testers or uh, this division is here and this division is there and they don't like working with each other. Now you take a few people from here and a few people from here and you put them in a team and you call this a scrum team. And in theory, they should be working together very well, but they are more attached to the other structures, um, then it won't work well. So I, I, would, I would recommend starting with these things and then, or at the same time, of course, choose some frameworks too. I, I cannot tell if what is the right framework now because I don't know enough about the company referred to in the question. But what I can say is that just the framework side of things, if you don't have the right culture and the right people and the right leadership and the right structure, it's unlikely that it will work. Good, good, thank you. Uh, I have one if, uh, before you continue. Please. Uh, it's ahead. more of a, yeah, I was uh, watching your presentation, Andre, and then, yeah, it's a very nice example with the pretzel and the value chain. But, so then there are two sides of the story. One is that you have your processes as a company, your team, uh, and you think of the value chain and then you start simplifying things. 
Mm-hmm. There are also the, the other approach that says, um, yeah, there are, we need to use a framework for whatever we're doing. And then you look at the various uh, frameworks in the line. Some of them are prescriptive. Some of them are more adaptive, like for instance, Scrum or Kanban. And then you want to choose a very light one, lightweight uh, framework. And then you say, okay, and then I'm going to add just what's needed to it. Mm-hmm. So it, both approaches may be some good in theory, but then in practice, in various cases, both of them also fail. So then what, <laughs> what do you, your idea is about this? How should one start looking at things? So to me, a framework is just like a, an oven. It's just another tool that I have to solve my business problems. So if, if I look at my business, uh, my company, my department, my team, and I, I know what my, my objective is, and uh, where do I want to get? From a product point of view, service point of view, team point of view, culture point of view, all those things. And depending on where, where I want to get, I will choose the framework. So for example, if I want to, if, if I start a startup, and we want to be very, uh, come up with a very uh, disruptive, innovative product in the market and move very quickly. Obviously that I will choose everything to fulfill that objective. I will want people with uh, those kind of personalities. I will, write, I will want very lightweight frameworks. I will, I will want a culture where uh, risk is encouraged and we take risks and we make decisions and we move fast. If uh, on the other hand, I am the CEO of a pharmaceutical company then due process and safety and those kind of things are very important to me. And I will choose a, a, a structure and a, a framework and people that encourage those things and uh, 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 due diligence and, and things like that. So a framework is just another tool and you choose the right framework for whatever you want to do there. Uh, everything can fail, uh, I think. There's no magic answer. Everything can fail. Sometimes it fails just because of bad luck. Uh, you know, some uh, pandemic comes or whatever and uh, your business was uh, affected by it. And no matter how well you prepare, maybe you cannot adapt. I'm just giving an example. Sometimes, but most of the times it fails because of uh, leadership, I think. And uh, that is the biggest thing you can have if you want to be successful, in my opinion. So uh, yeah, it's one of those, uh, I think a lot of uh, questions are un- answered with depends in our <laughs> industry. I think it's good that it's that way, but. Uh... Yeah. Okay, there's another question uh, related to uh, Lean, Agile, DevOps, continuous delivery. This is uh, obviously specific to engineering companies. How do they fit together? How, how have you seen them in practice? Sometimes, you know, agile and engineering, you know, tend to be part of different stories, surprisingly. Should it be <laughs> this way or? Agile and engineering. Um, good engineering. Uh, good, good engineering. Good engineering. I don't, I don't think so. So let, let's take them one by one. So how does lean and agile fit together? So in my view, lean is... 90% of Agile is, an, uh, uh, is Lean. Lean is the mother, father, and grandmother of Agile. There's, Agile is all Lean. There's, there's almost nothing in Agile that is not in Lean. Lean is the foundation for Agile. And Agile is a way to take those Lean concepts, sometimes change their name, and adapt them particularly, usually, mostly to software. And there's some specifics when it comes to software, like you said about DevOps and things like that. But if you want to understand the foundation of, of all of this is lean. DevOps, for example, and continuous integration is just a particular way to achieve the just-in-time uh, small lead cycle principles from lean. And lean came from Toyota and they called it the Toyota production system and they developed it after the second world war with Taicho Ono and Deming. And, and that's it, that's the history of it. And before that we go to uh, systemic management and tailor and other things. But this particular thing started at Toyota, became the Toyota production system, became lean manufacturing, and then it became lean everything, and then it became agile when we talk about software. So the relationship is very clear. There is no, and they fit well together. And when I, when I hear about agile practitioners that don't understand lean, that is amazing to me. It's just like, uh, 
it's like, I don't know, being a doctor without understanding what a cell is or what, what, what I don't know, what, what, what the DNA is, but you're a doctor because you just learned where to cut. So any agile practitioner needs to understand a bunch of lean, in, in my opinion. Um, when it comes to good engineering versus agile, I don't see it. I, I, I don't see a conflict. I, I, I don't know if there's more in the question, but I understand that sometimes some things are more difficult and they require more initial work. You cannot do everything from one day to another. I understand that kind of point, uh, but I don't think that's a fundamental contradiction. I think it's a healthy tension. Uh, the agile part of you wants to, okay, let's try to put things out, whatever out is in front of our clients, in front of our users and see if this is really useful rather than us being stuck in here and building something because we imagine it's useful. Let's put it in the real world. And sometimes in certain applications, you cannot put it in the real world every day. Maybe it's a bit slower, but you always want that tension, right? Like as fast as it can be. Okay. That's how I see it. Yeah, great. Uh, there's another one. Uh, it must have been asked by a person who's doing uh, probably training, agile training or something. Uh, Did you the, ask it? No, I, no, I didn't. <laughs> no. Although I very much relate to the question because sometimes clients, uh, clients for a for a agile trainer, uh, ask for a either basic or advanced agile training. What is that, in your opinion? You're you're doing lots of training, so what is a basic, medium level, and advanced agile training? I don't know what it means to other people. I can only tell you what it means to me. But if this question comes from a client, I have to understand what it means for that client. So obviously I will have a discovery conversation with that client. I will say, okay, I can do all kinds of agile stuff. Let's, when can, when do you have half an hour? So I understand more about your needs. And I will ask, and I usually, I won't ask, I will ask them to describe the situation, describe the situation, describe the problems as you see them. Describe what you don't like in how things are happening. Describe what you would like ideally to happen after this training. And I just let them talk and then I ask a few more questions. And you, you, based on your experience, you come up with an understanding of what is their situation, uh, what is their problem, what do they want solved, and maybe you also suggest additional things because based on your experience, maybe you can help them realize that that is not the real problem. Maybe there's an even bigger problem they didn't see. But that kind of, this is consultancy, right? Because I'm not just a trainer, I'm a consultant as well. I'm not just, okay, here's the training. Let me read the PowerPoint. This is the consultancy part of thing. And uh, without that, I wouldn't know how to sell anything because I cannot, it's not like a pretzel, right? I have to understand what the situation is. And if I understand what the situation is and I have conversations with those people, yes, then I will know what advanced means to them or whatever. And I will make a, a customized proposal for their needs. Sounds like a very good approach. I think we have time for one more question. And the question is, what, how does it, uh, a, a, a good agile coach looks like? Well, this is a very interesting question because coaching was, uh, still is, but I think the peak fashionability of coaching was about two or three years back when it seemed like half of uh, Yash was a coach. I think it's only about a quarter of a Yash, a coach now. Uh, and there's two ways to think about the word coach. One of them is a very specific way, which is this coaching and you go and train yourself and get certified to be a certain kind of coach. And these people usually, I'm, I'm speaking with, with respect for everyone. Uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying this is bad or good, but they are very, typically what I see is that they are very adamant about coaches being not uh, only using the questions, the Socratic method type of coaching. So as a, this kind of a coach, you're not telling people what to do. You're not giving them solutions. You're not, you're just asking questions. You're helping them figure things out. And obviously that's great. It's better to teach people how to fish rather than give them a fish. The other more pragmatic, not pragmatic, more older, old fashioned understanding of the word coach is the one I use for myself. So when I'm a coach, I'm like, you know, like one of those old baseball coaches from the American movies. I, I sometimes tell people what to do. I sometimes have opinions about what is the best option in a certain situations. And I try not to do it too much. And I try to, I also give them the space for it. And I tell them they can always disagree with me, but I am a, this kind of a more 
involved coach a little bit. And this is how I see it. I know many people see it the other way. And when you talk, this is one of those words in his definition. If somebody comes and tells me, are you a coach or not? I need to ask him, what do you understand by coach? And only then I can answer yes or no. Do you think, uh, I don't, maybe this is also one of the reasons why, uh, I'm going back to your talk now, why uh, some managers do under manage because it was that whole flame management versus leaders and then uh, you should uh, empower uh, people and teams and then sometimes they're afraid to be more uh, directive about it, things? Yeah, I think, I think uh, direct leadership is great. Leadership is a contact sport, is what I call it. Leadership is like jujitsu. Leadership is fought in the trenches. Uh, leadership is not asking wise questions. <laughs> it's part of it, but it's not only that. And um, it's, it's very difficult to tell people you want them to do something. If you, if you are responsible for a team, I don't care about specific job titles, and you go and tell them something like, let's work late tonight. It's a stupid example, but just an example. Um, I, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but maybe sometimes you need to ask them to do that, maybe then you expose yourself to the fact that they will say no. And what does no mean? It means we don't give a shit about you. <laughs> Actually, we don't like you. Actually, you're not important to us. Actually, we're not going to listen to you. We were just pretending to be nice because there was nothing important being discussed. And sometimes many leaders want, they didn't want to face this moment where the people are going to say no to them because that, that's going to destroy their whole image about themselves. And that's why it's difficult to ask people to do things because you don't want to be told no. And then you retreat. I'm not saying everybody does that, but if you are that kind of a individual and suddenly you hear about something like coaching, yes, that can be a, an escape for you because now you have like this uh, uh, wise sounding reason never to ask anyone to do anything. But I, I personally don't think that's leadership. I think leadership is, is, is about taking personal chances, taking the chance to ask someone to do something, to uh, take the chance of them you know, being there, being with them. I, I think that's the kind of leadership we need. My, just my personal opinion. Again, I'm not, I'm not blaming anyone else. I'm not saying I'm the smartest. Or, this is my thoughts. This is how I think about it. Is this something that you tackle in your fun and fearless leadership book? Yep, it was about that. You can find it on Amazon if you want to pay three euros or for free on my website, the Interest Specials. <laughs> okay, okay. So, all right. Well, I, I feel we could uh, talk about this uh, forever, but uh, we also have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're definitely gonna have you back with us uh, next time. So, thanks a lot, Andre. Thank for you so much. Have a great uh, conference and good luck to every other speaker. And uh, I hope it's going to be a great day. For you, sure it will be. Safe flights. Thank you. Let, let's bye, break. bye, everyone.